Family, listen, man, you're about to watch the first message of the year 2023. Woo! It's called, I'm not the same. Listen to me. God can do something big in you, not just for you. Big in you, and he can do it fast. This is your year to step out of steps. That's addition. And to go into a season of leaps. That's multiplication. Here's my request. If this blesses you in any way, helps you in any way, just share it with somebody else. Take care. Enjoy the message. Well, listen, I want to I want to I want to read one verse uh, in the book of Judges, chapter number eight, verse 22. And it's going to be a launching pad for uh, us leaping into our lesson today. It's um, to me one of my favorite Old Testament stories, and I think there's some value for it. Value for us in it. Today, Judges 8:22 says the Israelites said to Gideon, "Rule over us. You, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian." I want to talk from this subject as we conclude our two-part series called Multiply. I want to talk from this subject today. This is your testimony. Here it is. I'm not the same. <laughs> Clap your hands if you receive that. I'm not, I'm not the same. Family, this brief portion of this passage that I just read about a gentleman named Gideon is in my estimation a prophetic picture of what many, if not most of us, are believing for in 2023. What we see in this passage here in Judges 8 is what we call in the coaching and personal development space a quantum leap. The term quantum leap is borrowed from quantum physics where it describes how a particle of matter leaps, somebody say leaps, from one space to the next. And it is a picture of possibility, not only for matter, it is a picture of possibility for you and I. It is an indication of an alternative way for God to move you forward. In other words, most of us are accustomed to taking steps. I want to tell you God can orchestrate leaps. I'm going to say that one more time, change family. I said most of us are accustomed to simply taking steps. And there's nothing wrong with steps. But I came to tell you that God is not only the God that will order your steps. He will also orchestrate and empower your leaps. And let me just speak this into somebody's life right now. I know this is not technically a leap year, but it can be prophetically a leap year. If this is the year where you say, I'm going to stop stepping and I'm getting ready to take some leaps. I just want to know who I'm preaching to today in the room and don't lie. Is there anybody that's already declaring this is my leap year? I got too much ground to cover to step. I got a leap. I've got too much time to make up. I can't step. I got a leap. I got too many mistakes to recover from. I can't step. I've got to leap. Is there anybody that's admitting this is my leap year? He makes my feet like hinds feet. Deers, hind, they don't step. They, they leap. Did you hear what I just said? I'm not in the season of steps. I'm in the season of leaps. It means, this is important, guys. This is important. This is so important. This is so important. Because 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 your destiny requires disassociation. Um, yeah, how far you go determines who you not is determined by who you not willing to listen to. And so this idea now of multiplication or quantum leaps means that you have to reject the normal notion. The social norm, 
that progress can only happen incrementally. See, you can't live like no one else if you won't live like no one else. And many people want to live like no one else and live like everybody else at the same time. And I just spent five weeks telling you last week that average is not an option for a believer. That normal is not a word that describes you. And you shouldn't want normal because normal is dysfunctional. But when you've been associated and exposed to dysfunction so long, when the majority of the population is dysfunctional, it dysfunction now seems like it's functional. So when you start disassociating yourself from what the majority of the population is doing, they are so functional in their dysfunction that when you break free from dysfunction, they see you as dysfunctional. You can call me whatever you want to, but by the time 2023 is over, you're going to call me blessed. Whatever you call me, make sure you add that to it. Blessed. You can call me a hater, put blessed on it. I need somebody in the room to just air high five somebody and say blessed. Yeah, tell them run tell that since they got so much to say, so much to write about, I'm blessed. We got to reject the notion that all improvement can only be incremental. Just because it's normal doesn't mean it's true. I don't want a normal anything. I don't want a normal mind because most people stress. I don't want a normal relationship because most people tolerating each other. I don't want normal resources because most people barely making it. I don't want a normal church. I don't want normal. I had a gentleman I met yesterday, asked me last night, he said, how, pastor asked me, he said, how, uh, he said, you just got here. He said, he said, you just got here. How? <laughs> he was looking at me, and I wish I had an answer for him. He said, how do these people, you just, you've been here seven weeks, where these, I wish I had an answer for him last night. But I got some insight this morning. How did you do this? It's not because I'm so good. You know where I'm going. But 17 years ago, God gave me something in New Jersey. And we flipped it. We started with one location in one city. But that was normal. And I wasn't created for normal. Say, so God, don't just give us a city. That's normal. Give us a coast. Let's take the Northeast and the Southeast. And when God opened the door up here, y'all ready? Can I keep it real? How, how real can I keep it? You know, those little people, you know, little, little, it's, I got a little subliminal shade. I, I don't know if we, Going to come way up there. You need to be down in the cab. Y'all don't, y'all don't, is that too real for y'all? 
But I promise you, if you will plant good grass, wherever the field is, the hungry people will come and eat. You know why this vibe is so crazy? Because everybody here wanted to be here. You're not playing no games when you come all the way up here. This is not normal because you are not normal. Now, why would God connect you to an abnormal house if he only wanted to do normal things in your life? I'm, 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 I'm really, I'm really, I got 15 minutes, I promise you. Here it is. We need to reject the notion that there can only be incremental improvement. Of course, there are going to be areas where we will have a measured pace and incremental growth, but there are other areas where we can have exponential growth. We can have more than steps. We can have leaps. We can have more than addition. Addition, that's a step. Multiplication, that's a leap. We can have, we can have leaps and this is our year for leaps. But I was reading Judges, guys, and this story in the book of Judges, and I saw how it offered some insight uh, to this idea I'm trying to articulate today. Um, because the Bible is inundated with examples of what I'm trying to articulate. Um, the, the, the message I shared last week, uh, excuse me, last night, was a message that encouraged us to flip it. But what I see in this text is something really unique, Tario, and that is God will not only empower us to flip or multiply it, God will also empower and equip us to flip you. Did you hear what I just said? The Bible is filled with examples of exponential personal growth. It's not, it, come on, it's not cultural, but, but if you look at the Bible, you'll see plenty of examples of people experiencing quantum leaps, meaning in a short period of time, they become a radically different version of themselves. Some of them become such a different version of themselves that they are unrecognizable. You aren't talking to me here. Where God does such a big thing in such a fast period of time, it seems unreasonable, illogical, and therefore some people miss it and misinterpret it. Let me just speak two words over you for everybody that will receive this with prophetic implications. Big and fast. Well, let me see who... You got it, okay, let me say it again. Big and fast. Big and fast. Big and fast. God can do it big and he can do it fast. He doesn't have to do it long to do it big. He can do it big and he can do it fast. One day, you can be manipulative and conniving. Your name can be Jacob and it can mean heel catcher or swindler. And you can go to sleep one night and have a dream with a ladder that has angels ascending and descending. And you can end up wrestling with God in one night and you end up telling God, let me go. I mean, the angel ends up telling you, let me go. And you tell the angel, I will not let you go until you bless me. And when he breaks you, come on last night, when he breaks you, then he tells you your name is no longer Jacob, which means scammer, swindler, conniver. Your name is now Israel. It means prince with God. 
What's that? That's a leap. It happened big and it happened fast. You can be temperamental, impulsive, unreliable, quick-tempered while your name is Simon. And then Jesus gets a hold of you and says, you are no longer Simon. Now you are Peter. And you go from temperamental, impulsive, unreliable, unpredictable to a rock. You will go from someone who denied being associated with me three times in one night to when you get filled with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from that, you will stand flat footed on the day of Pentecost and preach to thousands and say, we are not drunk as ye suppose, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that in the last days I'll pour out my flesh, spirit upon all flesh. What's that? A quantum leap. Not a step. Not a leap. Now I'm not saying everybody in leap season. I'm saying I am. <laughs> I'm looking for who else. I'm just, I'm walking because I'm trying to see who with me. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with stepping season. I'm just saying I'm not in a season of stepping. I'm in a season of leaping. See, I'm, I'm not going to bother this. Some of you know this. One, the first quadrant of emotional intelligence is awareness. And when you have unbiblical definitions of biblical concepts, uh, orthodoxy equals orthopraxis, so you can't have good practice with bad doctrine. Does that make sense? So, that, so it's, it's really weird. And so most believers aren't biblically literate, so whatever sounds good, they assume it's sound. And one of the things I try to teach preachers is everything that works ain't right. Everything that gets a rise out of the people, not right. If you're telling them to have faith, but you're not telling them faith without works is dead. What you're going to produce is an inspired believer who's going to put into practice something that's not sound. And when it doesn't work, it's going to create a degree and a dimension of frustration that's going to cause them to question the credibility not of your word. They're going to question the credibility of Christianity. So now they think Christianity don't work because you gave them something that don't. But it shouted them though. They was hype. Almost out of time. Let me, uh, let me. <laughs> yeah, so, so anyway, 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 let me get back to this. <laughs> what, what we see, what we see here with Gideon is a powerful picture of this. This, this quantum leap. Y'all know, I, I can't leave you like that. I'm sorry. Let me just, let me just finish my thought. There, I promise I'll come back. I'll be taking these tangents. I'm trying to be disciplined, but I just got to say this. I ain't going to sleep tonight if I don't say this, okay? So let me just say this for me, even if you don't need this. The first quadrant of emotional intelligence is self-awareness, right? So, but when you got unbiblical definitions of biblical concepts like humility, you will confuse awareness with arrogance. So people who don't understand humility biblically will look at your awareness and call you arrogant. Well, if being aware mean you arrogant, you got to call Jesus arrogant because he was self-aware. Because much of what you know about Jesus, he told you about himself. See, y'all missed it. 
He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Let me go over here, y'all. No one come to the Father except they come through me. Jesus said, if you destroy this temple in three days, I'm going to raise it back up again. Am I talking to anybody that will say, I'm not arrogant, I'm just aware. I know what he gave me. I know what he put in me. I know what he equipped me for. I know what I've been called to. I'm not arrogant, I'm aware. And just because you don't have awareness doesn't mean you can criticize and critique my awareness. I'm praying that you step into yours, but I can't wait until you step into yours to walk in mine. So what we see with Gideon when we're introduced to him, which is in Judges 6, is a man, it's a man doc that's not aware. Because what happens is this, contextually, Gideon's people, the Israelites, were in a season, I don't even have time to unpack all this, they're in a season, Losco, of correction that they think is coincidental. Yeah, in, in, in the book of Judges, see, uh, in Judges 6, 1, it says, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. So they're in a season of correction. They think it's coincidence. They think life is lifing. God's like, not, life's not life. Sometimes life is life. And he said, life's not life now. I'm, I'm correcting something. Now, when the, whenever you see, here it is now. You got, it's, scripture has to interpret scripture. So if you're interpreting a scripture, if you're reading a scripture and you're interpreting it one way, and then you read another scripture in another part of the Bible and it seems to contradict what you just read, you've misunderstood something. Right? So there's something called hermeneutics. It's like a glass. It's like you got glasses, I got glasses. Your glasses affect what you see and how you interpret the Bible. So if you got father wounds, you're not going to rock with God being heavenly father. The so I can't, I got to fix your glasses. I don't have to fix the father. Nothing's wrong with the father. I got to fix your glasses. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. <laughs> anyway, anyway. So, right, so, so if, I, if I'm, like, dealing with forgiveness challenges, I'm going to read certain scriptures in the Bible about forgiveness, and the scripture can be a trigger. Yeah. Like seven times 70, not what they did to me. <laughs> Where's my honest church? Come on now. Let's keep it real. It's some stuff in the Bible, I'm like, yes. Then I read some other stuff, I'd be like, eee. That turn the other cheek thing, ah. Help me, Jesus, because. So when you see stuff like God delivered them into the hand, it, it doesn't say God calls Midian to capture them, does it? It says God delivered. So, in the Old Testament, when you see stuff like this, because the New Testament says God tempts or tests no one with evil. So if evil's happening, Paul is saying God's not doing that. He don't have to use that to test you, to perfect you, or tempt you. Does that make sense? But there's a difference between God causing and God using. So when you see in the Old Testament, the Bible saying things like he delivered, it's not active, it's passive. It's not saying he caused the Midianites to do that. He's saying that the Israelites rejected his leadership. And when you reject his leadership, the inherent consequence is you forfeit his protection. Y'all not talking to me. 
Because the Bible says in the days of Judges, there was no king in Israel, and every man, every woman did what was right in their own eyes. So they were saying, God, you don't get to lead me. And God's like, okay, but nobody can protect you if you won't obey. If you have children, the instruction you give them is trying to protect them. If you say, don't break dance on the glass table, you're tr come on, it's difficult to protect those that won't obey. I don't have time, but if I did, when he says, don't be, I'll leave it alone, yes. When he say, don't be unequally yoked, he said, I'm just trying to protect you. He said, but it's hard for me to protect who won't obey. I'm done. Here it is. Let me wrap this up. Tell y'all, this is what happens. What ends up happening is this. They're in this season, and God's like, okay, since you rejected me as your leader, I'm a shepherd, not a slave driver, so I won't force myself in an area you push me out of. But, but when you reject my leadership, by birth, I'm not funny acting and not going to protect you, but when you reject my leadership, you forfeit that. Because this will come, you lose this when you lose me. Somebody felt that in a different way, didn't you? You want to send that text right now. Don't do it, though. Don't do it. Don't do it. I know you feel it. You're like, yeah, you feeling all of that, huh, right now. You feel it. You thought you were, mm hmm Now you see everything you lost. God's like, you lose this when you lose me because you getting stuff you taking for granted because most of the things I protect you from, you didn't know about. You didn't know the media nights were your enemy till I left. They missed it. I, <laughs> they missed it. The media nights always been your enemy. You just never dealt with them. Because I was protecting you from stuff I ain't tell you about. Most of the stuff God does, you're unaware of. Because he's, so he's so good at his job, it don't even get close to you. Did you hear what I just said? I said he's so good at his job, it don't even get close to you. I was like, them media nights always been there. Just because your enemies aren't active doesn't mean is they're not present enemies not just people but adversity trouble trials so just because it's not active doesn't mean it's not present he said you got all sorts of danger in your proximity that don't get to you because of the hedge that I am around you this is why we should be proactive praisers yep next week come in with a proactive praise yep and when people ask you, what are you praising him for? I'm praising him for all the stuff he did this week, I don't know about. The accident I was spared from, I didn't know about. The sickness I was spared from that I didn't know about. The protection of my children from danger I didn't know about. So God says, I got I to gotta get a deliverer. Israel's under the hand of Midian for seven years. Man, that's a long time. God knows how long to let you sit in it till you mean it. Because sometimes you get out of it and you go back because you ain't stay in long enough. <laughs> I got to go. Are you? <laughs> God said, yeah. You told me, you told me that last time you was in it and then... I'm going to let you sit in it this time long enough so that this time when you get out, you mean. <laughs> Seven years. Seven years. But this is what's crazy. I told you I did some research and I saw, I'm in the lineage, I saw that the Midianites were a descendant of Midian. Midian was a son that Abraham had with Keturah. So this was an enemy that they related to. <laughs> next year, maybe next year. <laughs> related to them, jealous of them. 
because I'm from Keturah, not Sarah. You got it. Seven years. And they cry out to God for deliverance. And God sends an angel to a scared young man who has wheat. And he's threshing wheat in a place where they're supposed to press wine. Press the grapes for wine. He's threshing wheat. Because the Midianites... They were a different kind of enemy. They didn't annihilate Israel. They impoverished them. So they would wait until harvest season where all the crops were coming up. And then they would partner with other enemies of Israel because people who don't like each other will collaborate <laughs> when they have a common enemy. And they would come and whenever it was harvest time, they would strip, they would beat Israel and take their lives and steal their harvest. So Israel for seven years is working, grinding, hustling, and the harvest doesn't match their labor. I'm only looking for honest people right now who will say, I'm not greedy and I'm not unappreciative. But I know my harvest shouldn't be looking like this. Come on, come on. I'm not comparing myself to other people. I'm just looking at what's on the inside of me and what God's given me. I know my harvest shouldn't be looking like this. Dontario, here it is. So what Gideon does is he says, you know what? I know the Midianites are coming, so let me take this wheat and let me hide it in a place where I'm supposed to press grapes to create wine because maybe they won't come looking for me here. And an angel comes to him and says these words, the Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. Wait a minute. You calling me a mighty warrior? I'm acting the exact opposite of what you calling me so either God is lying or your behavior is I'm gonna say it one more time because I want you to get a mental breakthrough right there your behavior is lying to you because your behavior is telling you you are what you did he is Behaving in a way that is the exact opposite of what God calls him. He calls him a mighty warrior. Gideon doesn't see that in himself. He doesn't see it in himself at all. And this is what it says. Well, if the Lord is with us, then why has all of this happened to us? I love his honesty. I'm not even going to have time to bother this, but if you look through scripture, God has never been intimidated by people's honesty. I want you to, I just really want you one time to like take your spiritual glasses off and like read the Psalms and see how emotionally vulnerable David was in those Psalms. The stuff he said, if I read some of it to you, you would cringe. Because when you read it, you don't read it as a man who's journaling. Who, who, who's talking about his enemies and said, let his children be fatherless. See, y'all. <laughs> a man who gets so overwhelmed at one point, he said, I just won't leave everybody. He said, if I, got wing, if I had wings like a dove, I'd just fly. He said, i get in my car and just drive and let y'all figure this out. This is a king talking. Y'all don't want to hear that. This is a man in leadership who goes through moments where he's overwhelmed and exacerbated, exacerbated with the pressure, exasperated with the pressure that he's trying to carry. And so God called that man David a man after his own heart. He say, he's a man after my own heart. 
because he don't hide his. He's a man after my own heart because his heart is empty. He bears it all before me. Gideon's this way. He says, if, if the Lord's with us, then why does all this happen to us? And where are all these promises our forefathers talked about? He's so upset with this situation, he's missing the fact that God's trying to use him to change it. Because like, you keep talking about why you're in it. I'm trying to give you instruction to get out of it. He says, I'm going to be with you and you're going to deliver Israel from Midian's hand. And Gideon's dealing with an awareness problem. The problem isn't that he doesn't see God right. He sees himself wrong. And he says stuff like, my family is the least family in Israel, and I'm the least one in my family. And God doesn't even argue with him. He said, go in the strength you have. I'll be with you. He says, I'm going to be with you. Gideon finally agrees. There are 100, I think, in like 60-something thousand Midianites. Gideon has an army of 32,000 people, and God says, it's too many of y'all. Gideon say, what? <laughs> you talk me into this, and once I give you a yes, now you telling me? So you held that part till I gave you a yes, huh? It goes from 32,000 to 10,000. He says, all right, I want you to fight 100 and some thousand with 10,000. Get it, like, oh, my God. Then he finally agrees again, and God says, you still got too many. Get in, like, time out. He says, uh, no, so I don't, he says, so um, let's, let's bring it down from 10,000 to 300. So he's doing the math. He's saying, so I have to fight a hundred and something thousand with 300. But I, I, I want to show you something in scripture, though, and then I'm going to pray over us. And uh, we're going to wrap up here. It says, Judges chapter 7, verse 8, it says, Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Don't miss it. So it was 10,000 people. All of them but 300 go home. But the trumpets and the provisions of the, the 9,700 that left stayed with the 300. God's trying to show Gideon every loss, not a loss, son. See, did you hear what I just said? Every loss, not a loss. He says, you lost those people, but you ain't lose nothing. Did you, <laughs> did you hear what I just said? He said, you lost those people, but you didn't lose anything. Every loss, not a loss. He said, I'm going to do the same thing with 300 that you thought I was going to do with 10,000 because I'm giving you the provision of 10,000. Some stuff you call in a loss, not a loss. When that 32,000 went to 10,000, when them 22,000 people went, all God told Gideon to do is, he said, Gideon, tell the people who's scared and don't really want to fight to go home. And 22,000 left. God is showing Gideon, you don't have what you think you do. He's, he's telling Gideon, you losing what you never had. I just freed you from the illusion of thinking that you are going into battle with 22,000. So you, I don't care. He said, Gideon, this is all you are going into battle with anyway. And the Bible says Gideon obeys God with that 300 and it says that when they took the trumpets and the provision of that 10,000 and they made so much noise with it 
They start breaking the provision. They start blowing trumpets. It was so chaotic that the Bible says the Midianites turned and started fighting each other. Did you hear what I just said? He said, Gideon, you was nervous about having to deal with a hundred and something thousand, not realizing you wasn't going to have to defeat what you thought you were going to have to defeat. <laughs> this man goes from threshing wheat in a wine press to leading Israel in victory over Midian and we get to verse chapter 8, verse 22, where people who ignored him his entire life looked at him and said, rule over us. You, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Many people's problems is they stop reading your life story after your chapter 6. But keep reading because who I am in my chapter 6 is not who I will be in my chapter 8. I want to know, am I talking to anybody that's getting ready to leap into your chapter 8? Don't give up on me in my chapter 6. God's not finished with me yet. I am not the same. I'm done, family. I've kept you long again. I want to pray over you before you go. Lift those hands. I'm not the same. This year will be a quantum leap for you. You are starting it in chapter 6, but you will end it in chapter 8. There's a version on the inside of you that you are about to be introduced to this year. I pray that over your life. So, Father, for every hand that is raised in this room, I pray. Ooh, thank you, Jesus that you would move us from steps to leaps. We pray that we would not only multiply it, but you would multiply us. I pray that we go from Jacob to Israel, from Simon to Peter, from Abram to Abraham, from Sarai to Sarah. Change our names this year. And as you do so, may it be said of us as it was said of the early church, these are they that have turned the world upside down. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face of favor to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May he protect you. May he provide for you. And above all else, may he grant you peace. This is my prayer for your life. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next week. I love you. Hey, I want to thank you for watching. And I want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of our streams and any of our videos. All right. If this message bless you, do me a favor. Share it with somebody else. I'll see you next time.